right. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll uh, start our uh, discussions uh, first uh, with the uh, uh, distinguished uh, panelists. And uh, then we will uh, open the uh, floor uh, for you to also to contribute uh, to this uh, very interesting and important uh, topics uh, uh, regarding the polar governance. Um, I just wanted to make uh, one an announcement that the, the the entire uh, seminar is video recorded, and it is the uh, organizer's intention uh, to make the video available later on for on-demand viewing uh, on the website uh, after uh, the agreement of the speakers, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, your interventions uh, would also be included uh, in, in, in such a, uh, a video recording. Thank you very much. All right, so um, we have a very special guests uh, from uh, Iceland, uh, Akrari, and uh, uh, Dr. Eyo uh, uh, Gudmundsson uh, is director of the University of Akrari, uh, Iceland, and uh, he is uh, here for uh, uh, many uh, 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 topics, uh, uh, including uh, in, in Tokyo, but may I ask you, uh, from your perspective, on some of the uh, topics uh, that the, uh, Ivan uh, has touched upon? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chibara, and uh, thank you, Ivan, for a, a very interesting, uh, interesting uh, discussion uh, and, uh, and the presentation. And uh, the list of topics that I would like to comment on is too long for a, for a, for a, a short discussion here, but. In the, in the mic, thank you so much, yes. Uh, but in the end, there are kind of two points that summarize, I think, everything that, I, that you mentioned, and when, then we can take the dialogue from there. First of all, uh, I think all of us envy, envy you quite much to be retiring at this time, because you had this era of hope uh, University of Akureyri was a founding member of the University of Arctic, which happened around the same time as you were participating in the establishment of the Arctic Council. So this era from the closure of the Cold War and until we have the invasion of Russia into Ukraine, it's kind of era of hope. You know, you, it's, it's where international law and diplomacy worked to create new institutions and, and new opportunities. And you can now kind of comment to all of us how successful it was, and we cannot forget that. So when you go over all of the issues that you, that you mentioned, that was kind of the first, well, I guess the last thing, that struck, uh, last thing that struck me is that we cannot lose this. We, we, we have to remind uh, the leaders of the world today that this is uh, an ongoing work of decades and we are very much uh, in a position where we could <coughs> lose this success when we would go decades back into diplomacy. So th that, that's my, that's my big, biggest lesson, really, after, after listening to this. Is, uh, this is something we need to protect, just like we need to protect the uh, two uh, polars as well. Uh, at the same time, we are seeing very much of a difficult situation even without uh, the conflicts uh, happening in Europe at the time. Uh, when I started as rector at the University of Akure in 2014, uh, it was quite an optimistic time of seeing economic development in the Arctic. And Iceland was looking into uh, what would happen with the sea polar routes. Greenland is looking into additional mineral extraction. And it was kind of a interesting time saying we need to protect the planet, we need to protect the environment, but we need to evolve and develop the Arctic where people uh, live and need these, re need these resources to continue their livelihood uh, and increase it to, to modern standards. With the additional conflicts in Europe, there will be additional militarization in the Arctic. There is no way avoiding that. We saw the same happening in the 50s uh, after World War II. But the interesting part that in the 50s, 
then the Arctic kind of functioned as the, as the buffer between the two great powers fighting in the, in the, in the Cold War. Now this buffer is gone. So my question to you even is, where will this new border lie? Will it lie across the, the pole? Will we be moving this border back and forth? And a point that's obvious, but I've never heard said before, and I think you should take credit for that, Ivan, is when seven out of eight are mem NATO members, how will that actually change the dynamics, even with a resolution, some kind of resolution with the Ukrainian, Ukrainian, Ukrainian invasion or the Russian uh, invasion to Ukraine, uh, it will give a completely new picture of power balance within the Arctic Council. How do you foresee that impacting the work that you, you've seen there? So these were kind of my first observations, uh, and I'm willing to kind of go into more of them later on, but I think I'll give Timo some chance to comment, and then I also would like to hear from the audience. So if we, if we stop there. Okay, well, thank you very much. So maybe we, we go to uh, Professor Timo Koiverba because he will be uh, touching up on, again, also uh, mainly focusing on the Arctic, and then maybe I can uh, give the uh, uh, response uh, uh, opportunity for Ivan, and then if the time allowing, I would go for the Antarctic uh, comment. So, Timo, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ivan. Very, very uh, interesting and comprehensive uh, take on, on a lot of issues. So, so. Uh, there was a lot of ground that you covered. So a couple of comments just to kind of nuance something. Of course, you didn't have time to go into the details of, of what has happened in, in, for instance, in the Arctic. But uh, I would nuance it in a, in a way that that um, we probably wouldn't be saying that that um, everything changed when 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 24th of February um, Russia um, attacked uh, Ukraine. So this was kind of a long time coming. So from the uh, Crimean annexation, the, the stirring of the East Ukraine, uh, then there was a wave of uh, sanctions from the European states, from North, North America, of course, US leading, um, sanctioning um, uh, Russia because of Syria, because of Belarus, because of Navalny, and you know, several waves of, of, of sanctions, which kind of, worsened the, the kind of cooperative atmosphere kind of all the time. There was a military activities from from Russia, uh, especially in Barents Sea, Norwegian Sea, as well as NATO uh, troops. So for me personally, the situation had already kind of deteriorated kind of gradually. And, and, and it was not like that this was the kind of, it was a kind of clear milestone, but I wouldn't say that it was kind of a, you know, game changer because it, there was there were several kind of the, 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 the whole situation had already deteriorated, and I would say that to some extent it reflected on, let's say the the, the cooperation between the Arctic states. And now I'm kind of excluding the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement and the IMO Polar Code because those are larger kind of to me like more like global global type of processes. Um, if I'm correct, I think that the, the last real achievement of the Arctic Council was really the the, the uh, science agreement, and that was pretty much concluded already in 2016. So after that, there wasn't that much achieved in the Arctic Council. We can say that, the, for instance, that, that, that during the Icelandic chairmanship, it was possible to come up with a strategy for the Arctic Council, but um, there were not that much achieved within the Arctic Council uh, in the, the most recent years. So I, I think that that's at least my conclusion, and, and there we, might, we, may, we may debate about this. Um, I would also say about this kind of general point, as a long-standing observer, so I've been pretty much following the Arctic affairs from, from the mid-1990s. Um, so I, I guess that this, this, the last kind of years have really been a kind of the great powers kind of marching into the Arctic. So you can see that um, very much already with the, um, during the Finnish championship where I, where I was of course uh, very much uh, um, an insider to the, to the kind of functioning of the Arctic Council. And, and obviously then we, we started to feel the heat from the Trump administration. So 
for Trump administration, the, generally the kind of kind of multilateral cooperation, um, climate change, they were very difficult issues, and that that of course is something that we did in the Arctic Council very much so. So it started to influence the way Finland was was trying to carry out the the Arctic Council cooperation, uh, not overly much, I would say, but still. By you know again, kind of kind of gradually becoming more and more difficult, and kind of you know culminating with the foreign ministers meeting in Rovaniemi in, in May 2019, um, sorry, um, and then really uh, Mike Pompeo um, uh, coming to 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 my home, hometown and 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 with with the, with the troops and. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I guess that it was. No, I was one of the troops. <laughs> <Yeah. I'm sorry. laughs> Indeed, but but I was also he he gave a presentation there um, uh, one day before the, the the actual ministerial meeting and 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 those were really difficult times for for the Arctic Council because our diplomats there trying to really keep up the the work of the Arctic Council um, were confronted with the situation that that U.S. Do, does not accept the term climate change. And of course, it was a real controversy, and 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 I guess that what the diplomats have conveyed to me, and said, they have pretty much said that they weren't sure that that the Arctic Council would go forward. So I, this is just a good reminder that where we are now, in at least in my mind and, and in the minds of, of the Finnish diplomats, we were pretty low at that that time also. So, so I think that it's um, it's a good reminder, perhaps that that, and and my kind of prediction at the time was that if Trump gets four more years, we will have severe problems within the Arctic Council because uh, the, the the work at the Arctic Council was really, it wasn't kind of really kind of heavily detrimental to, to Trump. I mean, it was kind of minor things still, but but it was the the themes that were taken up there were not. Um, you know, particularly appealing to the Trump administration, I would say. And of course, then we saw, we did a study to our government in 2019 about China and China's kind of growing presence in the in the Arctic. We we were not altogether, altogether um, agreeing with Pompeo that, that um, China's presence is, is formidable. Um, but I think that it's, it's fair to say that, that many are concerned about the China's, let's say, long-standing role, also military role, in the Arctic region, if we look further out in uh, into the future. So that's something that, that I think that everyone need to need to keep in mind. And obviously, like now, now we see um, what Pompeo was um, um, uh, during the the, the, the ministry meeting or, or, or in his speech, also also flagging was was of course the the concern that most of the Arctic states already had that Russian militarization of its Arctic regions, of course had had all, all the time kind of continued. So that was an, another another thing. So I, I guess that, that just a general comment that this kind of great power rivalry. Gives, doesn't give a lot of space for us to start thinking about cooperation. And, and now let's let's assume that there is a, a time in the future that 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 you know the war is over and we can we can again continue cooperation. And we we do have climate change and other important issues there to to to, to tackle. But we do have also the problem that this this great power competition is all, also with us. So it's a kind of a, a, a big complicating complicating issue. These are the uh, short comments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Timo. So on the Arctic issues, may I ask uh, Ivan to uh, maybe respond? Thank you. <clears throat> so thank you for these uh, great uh, uh, comments. Um, I uh, normally try not to think that um, my earlier life it was part of an era of hope and that has ended because that's too depressing to to think in those those terms uh, exactly but I, I do understand uh, what you mean by that um, I agree that there will be additional militarization in the Arctic in the current circumstances I think that that is inevitable um, the way I think national security officials and relevant Arct uh, Arctic governments uh, felt about these matters like five years ago and now is, I think, quite, 
quite different. Um, and so the, the focus on the security side uh, is now, in a way, crowding out some of the uh, what had, we had all felt was a much more positive narrative about cooperation, making things a lot more difficult. Um, when you mentioned the idea of, of borders, I, one of the, th the issues that I didn't mention in my remarks, which I, is still important, I think, for the Arctic, is related to extended continental shelf. And that's an area where um, particularly the five littoral states of, in the Arctic had worked um, very cooperatively in terms of their um, rights under Article 76 of the Law of the Sea Convention. And we had regular meetings, including with the Russians, where there's a lot of sharing of information. And to my understanding, uh, that uh, cooperation, while it isn't as, is perhaps not entirely necessary in order to um, continue with operation of Article 76. In fact, the activities of the U.S., Russia, Canada, et cetera, have continued in a way that is peaceful um, and is uh, productive through the Commission for the Limits of the Continental Shelf. Um, so that is another example, along with COFA and some of the others, where things are kind of still moving forward in a way that isn't, uh, isn't negative. So we grasp at these things if, if we can. Um, so, uh, Timo, I, um, um, I, I, I agree that it, it isn't as if um, everything was wonderful and all of a sudden the, uh, there was this additional invasion of Ukraine and uh, it all sort of turned 180 degrees. There were all of this problem caused largely by uh, President Putin and his activities. Uh, you didn't mention uh, his uh, interference in U.S. elections, which is, was a major problem uh, for the U.S. Um, but uh, all of these things, there was a sort of brewing uh, difficulties, which um, um, have you know, taken us to this, this very difficult uh, place. Um, and then, and it's not just Russia that was creating waves. You've mentioned changes in U.S. policy over time related to climate change, related to support for rule of law and in international institutions. This is something which is now uh, a, a little more um, back on course in the traditions of U.S. policy than it, it was uh, a, a couple of years ago. Um, and yet that had all sorts of impacts politically and otherwise on, on the Arctic uh, Council. So um, you do have this problem of the great power rivalry creating difficulty or edging out areas of cooperation. But I do think it's important to also keep in mind that a great deal of cooperation occurs that doesn't require the Russians. Now, Russia makes up half the Arctic. They're absolutely critical to anything that relates to you. If you want to talk about something that's pan-Arctic, you really have to involve Russia one way or the other. At the same time, the situation with Russia has really very little impact on the relationship between U.S. and Canadian scientists or, or U.S. and Japanese scientists. Uh, or large areas of marine science that continues. There's a lot of great value and great investment that, that continues. So it's a complicated narrative, and you have to look at it kind of piece by piece. Do you need certain kind of d data sets from Russia to, to understand permafrost melt? Do you need access to information from Russia? Well, you probably do. But can you do a lot of things in Alaska or with Finland or with Iceland directly? Those things do continue and, and quite positively. And so you have to take all of that, I think, into account. All right, thank you very much. Um, 
Of course, I would like to open the floor, but let me just inject a few uh, Antarctic uh, points so that uh, the audience can also uh, uh, interact with those issues. Um, I think I agree with you, uh, Ivan, uh, that uh, there has been some uh, this degradation of cooperation and particularly the atmosphere. Uh, in the Antarctic Treaty system, including the uh, uh, the Canada uh, issues, uh, but I, I think uh, you have mentioned this uh, correctly that uh, this has not happened just because of the Ukraine uh, 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 crisis. It, it was the case even before uh, the Ukraine uh, uh, crisis, and uh, but uh, there might be some opportunity opportunities in a negative sense that uh, some of the parties in the, in the ATS, both the Kamala and also the Antarctic Treaty, they might take advantage of this degradation of uh, 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 atmosphere so that they can actually would try to weaken the institution itself. And in the case of Antarctic Treaty, the institution is the treaty itself. And uh, I see a more uh, a vulnerability of this uh, degradation of atmosphere uh, uh, for the treaty system. For example, um, the issue of uh, admission of a consultative uh, party uh, for uh, some of the uh, com uh, upcoming uh, countries, uh, including Belarus and Canada, for example. It should be dealt with very fairly and also objectively under the treaty. <laughs> there is a provision for that. But of course, some uh, countries may take advantage of this situation so that they would actually weaken this uh, uh, system of admission of a consensus party to the ATS. Another example might be the uh, uh, specially uh, protected species, the emperor penguin case. Um, I don't know what happened there, uh, but it seems like this uh, degradation of atmosphere, atmosphere at, the, at the meeting uh, in Berlin, that might have caused an easier uh, uh, atmosphere for objecting on many things, including uh, this issue. So what do you think uh, in the Antarctic context? Uh, uh, do you think this uh, Ukraine situation would, uh, would, would trigger this weakening of an institution uh, more so, or uh, would you see uh, differently uh, for the Antarctic Treaty system based on the treaty? Thank you. So it's a very complicated question, I think, and it revolves in many ways around the consensus-based decision-making uh, that is involved at both Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meetings and at CAMELAR. So, as I mentioned before, the most, um, the, the issue with greatest political energy these days in the Antarctic Treaty system is found within CAMELAR and relates to the marine protected areas. So, the last time there was success on that, with the help of Russia and China, frankly, uh, was the creation of the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area. Since then, the Russians and Chinese seem to have a kind of buyer's remorse. And not only do they not want new MPAs, large-scale MPAs, or any MPAs, they have trouble with implementation of the Ross Sea MPA, which is needed in order to uh, help carry out the science and do the things for which the, the MPA was, was in fact intended. So this sort of momentary coming together with cooperation kind of dissipated, created more difficulty. So the, the failure to, well, uh, to agree on emperor penguin protection was, was basically because of uh, Chinese action in Berlin, I think is uh, it does raise this question about whether there's a willingness to listen to the concerns of other states or a f kind of freedom to, well, we're going, if we don't like it, we'll just block it. When that starts to happen, um, all sorts of issues related to fisheries management and conservation become at risk. So I would say that the emperor penguin issue in some ways is more symbolic in, than, and less concrete than the marine protected areas 
which there is a current you know, um, need, a very strong push by lots of governments seeing the need under the 30 by 30 program and the you know, attempts to move forward internationally on ocean conservation. That is, is an area where Camelar and the Antarctic Treaty System really needs to play a leadership role. And by continually blocking, you have Russia and China kind of standing in the way of what other, and frustrating what other governments want to do. And that, I think, creates the kind of uh, tensions that, that, that you're talking about. And could there be a spillover at some point into the continuation of the ban on uh, mineral resources, that kind of thing? We have to think about the future, n not, just, n not just from a legal angle, but from a policy angle. Do countries come to these meetings with a basic desire and mandate to cooperate? Or do they just feel free to do whatever they think is their national interest at the moment? So um, some of the traditions of the treaty system, I think, are, are at stake. All right. Well, thank you very much.